need to pass on, and actually that's again a nice link when we're talking about digital libraries and resources. Uh, Professor Paul Claw from Sheffield, he's working with information retrieval. So I asked Paul to come because I was conscious when we had this thing in the balance, we haven't done that much about digital libraries or digital resources or things online in cultural heritage, where an awful lot of us are working with or even developing. And what can we actually do in terms of evaluation? Um, most times remotely, OK, you can do your in-depth maybe focus groups, but what can you find out about what people are doing with this kind of information? So um, he's going to talk um, a little bit about the PATHS project that they tried some things out with Europeana, but I think there are wider lessons to be learned there, some questions for us to think about about the scalability and the use of all these different technologies. So I'll pass on to... I'm just going to uh, uh, use a browser as well just to show you a demo of the system because I think it's a bit easier than me trying to explain the system. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure I have the web working on my laptop though. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry about that. I think Is it? Okay. free Wi-Fi doesn't seem to be working, so I'm not very sure. It might be safe. In that case, I'll just, descri I'll just describe the system instead then. Maybe you can, because it can work on people's devices. Okay, yeah. You, want you can... URL I, I can point people to it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we've evaluated uh, information searching, uh, in particular in a, uh, within a project, an EU-funded project, uh, where we're trying to kind of uh, enable access to digital cultural heritage. So I thought what I'd do is just talk a little bit, first of all, about evaluating search success and typically how we do that. Then I'll talk about the uh, uh, EU-funded project in which we were looking to evaluate the system that we built, particularly from the point of view of enabling people to access the underlying digital content. Uh, then I'll just talk a little bit about some of those evaluation activities to give you a flavour for some of the types of uh, things that we did within the project, uh, together with a bit of reflection, really, on some of the issues and challenges that faced us, but I think also face uh, the field as well when it comes to evaluating particularly the search uh, component. So I guess the question you have to ask yourself first is kind of what makes a, makes a search system successful? So of course companies like Google will be asking this, um, but also intranet uh, providers will be asking this, uh, providers of enterprise search systems and so on will be asking this. And so it could be to do with you know, whether, whether the system retrieves relevant results, how quickly it returns results, how well it supports user interaction, how well it supports the user experience, how well it supports people being able to find the information that they want, carry out the tasks that they need to do, uh, solve uh, problems, make decisions and so on. And I guess if you had to select one of these, which one is the most important? And of course, if you're the provider of a search system or the provider of, a, of, a, of an online site, you may not be able to evaluate everything. You might have to narrow it down to just one or two things. But if you ask yourself which of these are the most important, well, I guess the answer might really be, well, it depends. And partly it depends upon who you ask, that is the stakeholder. So you ask the IT person, the developer, well, they're probably going to focus quite a lot on system. Whereas you ask the end user, they might focus on user experience. You ask the person paying for the product, they might focus on cost benefit and so on. So I think the answer to the question will depend upon who you ask. I think it also very much depends upon the user themselves and the context. We already heard about sense making, situation, constructing your own kind of experience, knowledge and so on. And so, you know, depending on the tasks that you're carrying out, depending upon the situation, whether you've got much time, less time, and so on, uh, will affect uh, your perception and your uh, feeling on what is the most important when it comes to success. Uh, and I guess this partly folds in when we think about evaluation of search, uh, and I've tried to sort of, I've, I've taken a diagram from a very good book on uh, kind of interactive uh, search, uh, but what this tries to do is... Whoops, it's basically uh, sort of put search in a context, and there are various layers of context, if you like. So a lot of my work is really focused on the search system as well and evaluating the output, the results of the search system. But the search system itself fits in a wider context of somebody who is carrying out some kind of information-seeking task, trying to solve an information need. So you might evaluate with respect to information-seeking that wider context. But of course, it doesn't stop there, does it? Because your experience with the search system or that uh, online site is part of a wider context. It could be part of a work task. It could be part of a kind of you know, a job that you have to do. And of course, all this fits in some kind of larger socio-economic technical um, kind of co uh, context as well, which would shape, again, success and what success might mean. 
And so a lot of people have thought about maybe levels of success where you do your evaluation. Maybe you evaluate with respect to the kind of system itself, you know, and the nuts and bolts, the algorithms, and how the bits are put together. That's at one end, but you might also evaluate with respect to the, you know, the interface, usability, and so on. But you may also evaluate with respect to social, experience, economic, benefit, cost, uh, and so on. So a lot of evaluation in search, and particularly a lot of the evaluation I've been involved with, has perhaps been a bit more system-focused or system-centered. That is really focusing on the output of a retrieval system, that, you know, that, that rank list. Query in, rank list out, and how you might um, do that kind of assessment. Uh, so evaluation criteria might be things like retrieval effectiveness, how many relevant items do we have in the top 10, the speed of response, and that kind of stuff. The sorts of uh, measures might be things like this that you may or may or not have heard of uh, before, and the sort of methods that you might be uh, make use of things like standardized benchmarks. So maybe doing evaluation in the lab. But typically, you know, we also want to measure aspects of retrieval performance beyond the system. So remember that context. We're not just constrained of the system itself. What about the system in situ, system in use? And that is typically where you might do more user-oriented or interactive uh, retrieval. And so you might consider things like user satisfaction with the results, usability of the interface, engagement, experience, user performance with a task, uh, or and all that kind of thing. Uh, you might have common criteria including things like satisfaction, uh, usability, uh, and so on. And various evaluation methods will, will then be slightly different maybe from the system-oriented uh, approaches where you may have things like lab-based controlled experiments where you get your participants in a lab to conduct a series of tasks through things like naturalistic observation, so evaluations more in the real world as opposed to kind of in a lab setting, through things like predictive evaluation, so cognitive walkthroughs, kind of usability testing, and so on. And measures might include things like, you know, characteristics of interaction. Uh, so it might be where, you know, number of uh, uh, items clicked and so on. Performance measures, things like number of saved uh, documents, or subjective measures. Ask people to rate usability, the experience, and so on. So there's a whole range of different methods that could be used, both from a system perspective and a more user-oriented perspective. And this diagram just tries to sort of lay out in a landscape uh, from a well-known person in interactive IR, a lady called Diane Kelly, the kind of, br the, the wealth, if you like, the breadth of uh, different types of evaluation methods that are available, right the way through from basically very controlled lab-based settings where you kind of simulate the user, right the way through to far more kind of real users, real scenarios, real needs, where we don't give them tasks, we don't make things up, but you're doing things in a naturalistic environment. And of course, this is important because at this end, things are lovely and controlled. Uh, we have uh, variables, independent and dependent. At this end, it's a bit of a mess. It's the real world. How do we know what's affecting what? How do we know what's affecting success? And evaluation will lie along you know, this uh, kind of you know, uh, set of activities somewhere. And it makes it just very challenging, certainly on deciding what to do in terms of evaluation setup, but also whether you control, whether you have something a bit more unconstrained naturalistic, uh, and so on. So kind of what I wanted to do in this uh, presentation was just sort of say, well, when we were looking at evaluating the PAL system, we had to think a little bit outside the search box. A lot of what I had done had always focused on the search box, uh, and that being the only component. But you look at a lot of applications today, you look at Amazon, you look at you know, some of those big providers, they don't just have a search box. They have hierarchies, they have taxonomies, they have visualizations, recommender systems, and so on. And these are ways to assist people with finding uh, the information that they want, to be able to browse, to be able to uh, discover and learn. Um, so basically what I wanted to sort of think about and what we had to think about in the PATH project is how do we go beyond just evaluating the search component, which we know very well. How do we evaluate something like a visualization as a component in the overall system? And in this project, we also had to think a little bit more on, and I think somebody mentioned it before, not just a one-off evaluation, but we had to think about evaluation over the life cycle of the project. That is not just evaluating, say, the browse component, say a hierarchy on its own, which we would have to do if you're developing it, but what about when you put it together as an interactive prototype? How do we then evaluate that? And a typical project will have multiple evaluations, not just one evaluation, using a variety of methods. 
So all of this was kind of came around because we're involved in this project called the PARS project, uh, which basically tried to uh, enable uh, kind of access to digital cultural heritage material, in particular material that was drawn from a system called Europeana. So I don't know how many people have heard of Europeana, but it's kind of aggregated uh, a digital library portal, if you like. Uh, so it's basically a, a collection of collections. It's an aggregation of museums, libraries, galleries, the metadata from around Europe brought into one uh, place. And uh, if you like, one of the issues with European is that typically it has just a search box and it in its mode of discovery is mainly through search. But a lot of people want to browse, they want to kind of uh, have a look around this content. And so what we tried to do is develop some techniques, some features, interface features to help various types of people, both more expert users together with less expert users, to gain access uh, to the wealth of stuff, the digital stuff that is on uh, Europeana. One of the things that we also want to investigate in the project was the use of trails or paths to enable people to create their own journeys uh, through the Europeana uh, landscape. Uh, it's something that's been well used, so hypertext is a classic of a, example of that. Digital storytelling is something that really is kind of gaining traction at the moment. And of course, this is something that's really nicely done in the physical space, where we have kind of curated exhibitions and collections and so on, but actually it's a bit more difficult and it's a bit more of a mess in the kind of digital space, and it's something that we wanted to explore uh, within the, uh, the project. So basically, we built a system that enabled uh, or helped people through their whole information journey. So again, this is thinking beyond just the search box and just the search component. It was helping people kind of uh, find stuff. But when you found the stuff, it's helping people to kind of interpret the stuff, make sense of the stuff, and then helping people to subsequently make use of the stuff as well. And so making use of the stuff was to form a story or to form a path, uh, a trail through the collection that other people could then follow and make use of. And so, uh, as a part of the project, uh, we interviewed uh, a range of curators, we interviewed a range of um, uh, kind of people from archives, museums, and so on, and we developed a kind of, a sort of, if you like, just a descriptive model to help build the system on top of this. And so we basically had a system that would help people basically find stuff through a range of options, through a range of modes, uh, using things like a visualization search box and so on, then uh, help people to kind of create, if you like. So basically find the stuff, and then sort of put the stuff together in terms of paths and trails. So part of the collection was through provision of a workspace, for example, and be able to collect items over several uh, kind of sessions or encounters with the system. And this kind of descriptive model was very useful because it helped us then build the system to basically hopefully support people who are going through uh, this kind of these processes. So the kinds of interface components that we built, and just to say that these interface components were only possible because we did quite a lot of um, language processing, quite a lot of text mining underneath the system. Uh, so for example, we took the collection, and the problem with Europeana is that because it's an aggregation of lots and lots of different other collections, there's no kind of underlying universal taxonomy. There's no underlying hierarchy that you could use for browsing the collection. So we tried methods of automatically inducing a hierarchy from the data itself, data-driven approaches. We also tried approaches, for example, for clustering the data, uh, for being able to make recommendations, uh, identifying kind of similar items, so cross-referencing items that were kind of similar, whatever similar means. Uh, we also uh, tried a method of um, a kind of a map-based visualization to give you an overview of the overall uh, collection itself. Uh, and that's particularly useful perhaps when you don't know where to start. Or maybe your task is not one of actually, you know, finding something specific, but you just, what's in the collection? So we give them a kind of a, a, a collection overview. So you can play around with the system yourself, um, so do feel free to have a go. I would have shown you, but we haven't got a connection. But it looks something like this, and sorry it's quite small. I tried to just pack it on one slide. But here, for example, is a kind of map-based, you know, Google Maps style of visualization that basically shows the subjects or the, or the uh, topics of items in the collection. And we use a process where we basically group or cluster the items together, and we generate this kind of map view. So this is basically a view of 1.5 million items uh, selected from European, and we get groups such as society, culture, people, history, agriculture. And then the idea is it's, it's interactive, a bit like Google Map. You can zoom in, zoom out. And that's particularly useful if you just want to get an overview of the collection. Then we have things like with individual items, we have, sorry, you can't see it very well, but things like related items. 
and we tried different methods of deciding how things could be related. So things could be related because they're by the same artist or by the same creator. They could be related because they're in the same time period uh, and so on. And then this one, which I'll just show you, hopefully I've got a bigger screenshot. This one was an example of uh, the types of paths that people could create. And so here, for example, and, and so the boxes here represent either items from the collection or you could just create a box. So if, for example, you were trying to, say, tell a story, you might have a box that says, this trail or this story, this path is all about da-da-da-da. My trip to Glasgow when I went to speak at the workshop. And so this path is about architects, uh, and in particular, um, architects from Glasgow. And then we have people like Charles uh, McIntosh, and then, and so on. And so what's quite nice about here is that unlike a sort of linear path, which is often what you see in a lot of uh, existing sites, people could basically sort of move things around and create almost a mind map where you could have branching and so on. And so this was an artifact which was then sort of, you know, could be used for, I don't know, guiding other people, could be used for um, learning, teaching, and so on. And what's quite nice is that we did an analysis of this, and actually when you give people the functionality to sort of branch out and do interesting things, they are quite creative. Some people do things or, or paths that are quite linear. Other ones created quite sort of interesting structures. And these become useful in terms of uh, uh, aiding people, guiding people through the collection. But then the challenge for us is how on earth do we then evaluate all of this? So here are just some of the evaluation activities that we uh, carried out. So PARS itself as a system, uh, like most systems, so unlike uh, some cases where you have a system and you're doing evaluation with a working system, uh, we, we built a system uh, from scratch. And we went through a process of kind of requirements gathering, prototyping, uh, evaluation, and kind of repeating that in a fairly iterative fashion. But I think what was interesting about this from an evaluation point of view is that because we had all these different components, and because we were kind of, you know, sort of spread throughout Europe, somebody building the uh, recommender system, somebody else building the kind of map and so on, everybody was evaluating their own bit. And so in a sense, that gave us a bit of a challenge because normally I only ever did evaluation of a search box. How, all, how do you evaluate a recommender system? How do you evaluate a data visualization? And so what we ended up doing was sort of going into these fields and using their well-established evaluation techniques. And that is what I mean by sort of thinking outside the search box. In terms of evaluation, particularly of the components, we had to go outside our normal kind of search box mentality of doing evaluation. We had to learn from these other fields. And so we had basically evaluation carried out of components. This happened before we had a working prototype. So that's before you can start sitting people down in a lab doing user evaluation. So that is, these types of evaluations are important, particularly from the developer's perspective, okay, if you're developing, say, a recommender system. So we had evaluations that were carried out by individual researchers building the algorithm. What's the best algorithm for re making recommendations? Do that in the lab, say, and then once we've decided, we put it into our working prototype. We then had people who were focused on building the system architecture, and those, those guys were doing, and, and women were doing evaluations that were more kind of, you know, what software developers do. So testing things like integration, do components talk to each other? What about speed of response and so on? That evaluation is quite different from the sort of uh, evaluation an academic does, building research component, which actually was quite different from the evaluations that were then being carried out by the UI people. They were doing things like paper-based sort of drawings and cognitive walkthroughs and all that kind of stuff. And that actually was then quite different from the types of evaluations that we were then carried out by so-called end users. And we had various end users. We had kind of controlled lab-based settings, which are normally students, as our you know, prototypical uh, end user. But we also tried to branch beyond the student and do some field trials in a more naturalistic setting as well, where we had other types of user using the system. But this does present a bit of a challenge in terms of the diversity, the range of techniques, and how you bring all this together. How on earth do you make sense of all this evaluation data uh, to know whether your system is uh, working uh, well or not? So this is just an example of the sort of thing that you might follow, a sort of protocol you might follow for something like the lab-based experiment. And uh, again, I can, I've, there's a few references at the end where you can kind of have a look at these uh, in more detail. So in terms of issues and challenges, uh, I think there are lots of issues and challenges that face you when you're kind of thinking of these types of interactive systems, which I think are becoming more um, kind of uh, uh, available now. So some of the aspects that you have to think about is how on earth do you combine those user and system approaches? 
In a sense, the user approaches and studying user behavior is very helpful because it, it informs, if you like, the evaluation you might do in the lab. How do we know what queries to use? How do we know what tasks to set people in a lab-based setting? Well, why don't we find out what tasks people actually use these types of systems for in the real world? That should inform uh, our kind of evaluation approaches. On the other way, in the lab, can help predict how a component might perform in the real world. So I do my evaluation in the lab and my recommender system, and hopefully if I've done it well, then it will predict it will work like this in the real world. But that's a challenge for us. What about the, the relationship between evaluation criteria and the evaluation measures? So how does kind of, you know, the kind of satisfaction relate to system performance? Is there a link and so on? How do we, how do we uh, make that work? How do we share evaluation practices amongst domains? So we have events like this, and we need more events. We need to invite data visualization specialists, recommenders specialists, and so on, who all have their own ways of doing evaluation. And we need all of that when we think about evaluating this as a whole. We also need to think beyond ad, ad hoc search tasks, which is what I normally do. I just think of queries and people searching for specific items. How do you evaluate a system for whether it supports serendipity, whether people bump into stuff? How do you put support system, uh, or how do you evaluate a system to support browsing? That's completely different from, say, a known item uh, or a topical search. What about the evaluation results that we have? So one thing we noticed in PARS is that we evaluated the individual components. So like the search component, which we worked on, fantastic. Precision, you know, precision was brilliant. But actually in the context of when we ask people about what's the most useful component, uh, which, which components are the most beneficial, fun to use, and so on, the search component is not it. Okay, so it's interesting, you've got kind of these different views, if you like, on success. How do we bring them together? How do we uh, uh, resolve those? And other issues consider things like, well, what about, you know, not just thinking about the list of results, but what about when you've got a list of results and a map next to it, and something like that? Okay, how do we, how do we evaluate that? How do we evaluate the relevance of that? So I guess I come back to what constitutes success. And it's maybe something to think about today. In the, in the types of systems that you are building and that we are building for digital cultural heritage, what constitutes success? What should we be focusing on? Uh, so that's all uh, I wanted to say. There's, just, um, there's a chapter written up in a book edited by Ian, um, a very good book on cultural uh, heritage information. I hadn't planned that. Um, <laughs> and there are some other, if you're interested in certain bits of the project, I can point you to some other references or contact me uh, if you want to know more as well. Thank you so much for wrapping, I think, very nicely and leading on to the conversation afterwards. And in fact, I think the question was probably just what Paul himself kind of put out there without necessarily answering them, but it all depends on what is success, really. And I think this is very nice to frame the discussion afterwards. I had kind of, um, I'll take first from the room, but I just had a small dis um, question about which, from all the things you tried, was there something clearly more useful than others? In Maybe terms of the methods, yes. Methods. I think, again, it depends. Or is it really quite it really, complex? Really? Yeah, it sort of depends on what you're trying to establish. If you're trying to, say, uh, establish What's the, so from the EU's perspective, when you write that deliverable evaluation of that first prototype system, it was really about that lab-based evaluation, which was kind of user's perspective in a kind of task-based setting, carrying out some different tasks, you know, things like um, satisfaction and so on, with the system itself as a built prototype. But if you're talking about the person who's building the recommender system component, from their perspective, the most important thing is having some resource, maybe you know, a standardized resource, for evaluating their recommender system so they can work out which algorithm is the best. I think the difficulty is it, it really does depend. You know, if you talk to you know, the EU paying for it, what does success mean to them? Well, what's the impact of the project and so on? So again, I think it's quite hard to say what's the best, but I do think the kind of probably lab-based evaluation which took into account the whole prototype was probably the most informative for us, I think. Maybe while others are warming up, uh, another one about the field trials you mentioned, I, I understand how the lab one worked. How exactly Europeana users all over the world, very diverse material, how did you choose and find users for field trials? Yeah, that's a good one. So these are slightly uh, perhaps artificial. So the field trials were really meant to uh, test out an iPad mobile version that we had um, of, of, the, of the system. And so one of the partners in their own country 
uh, worked on the field trials. So they had a body of people, uh, which were, I think, people who were visiting a particular institution, uh, a gallery or museum, that they used to kind of, you know, uh, test uh, within that kind of field trial setting. So we sort of targeted a specific group of people. Um, I, th I think it's great that you did all these kind of layered evaluations. A lot of people would just do your know, one summative evaluation at the end. Yeah. But I was interested, were, when you were doing all these, were there conflicts in the results of the different evaluations that one might have said this is positive and then you tried it in a different evaluation you got a negative result? Or? Um, so I think the way that the components were built is that they tended to be quite um, separate. So success was measured in that just for that component. I think what we did notice is that when you bring them together and then we had the kind of users testing a system as a whole and we asked people, for example, you know, for that task, what was the most useful component for you to help you uh, find the task? Um, I think that's where we had the conflict. So I'll give you an example. We, we spent ages building this funky map. We were really proud of it. You know, really, it was the best thing that we thought we'd ever invented. And on its own, in a kind of you know, a artificial setup, it rated re fairly well. However, when we put it into and launched it in the prototype itself, when you actually ask people to do, carry out tasks, the map became a distraction. It's kind of fun. It gives you the wow factor. But actually, to carry out a specific task, it's not particularly useful. And I think that's where the challenge came in. Then what do you do? Do you just provide everything and let people use the bits that they want? Or do you personalize and target people? Um, so, so I think that's for us where the, the kind of tension started to come in. Thank you for this. I mean, it, I think it might be a bit of a left field question, uh, given that it involves Europeana. Um, so you had the opportunity to create a new, I mean, as far as I understand from your description, a really a new way of using that data, uh, allowing people to make connections, mm -hmm. see relationships, etc. Yeah. Was there any, let's say, ideological kind of pretext in the way that you would allow users to do that, which is mm -hmm. different to what uh, Rupiana's kind of motivations were. It, does, you, that's, does the system embody uh, or um, kind of bias, but not in a negative way necessarily, a certain way of looking at the data? And um, Our system it, or Europeana? Your system. <laughs> So it does in the sense of we tried playing around with various mechanisms to kind of do things like vary the results that are presented. We tried things like, you know, creating these trails, which would be kind of a guide. If you don't know what's in the collection, well, just have a look at a trail, maybe a trail about World War II or something. These are items that somebody thinks are interesting or, you know, as they've told a story of them. So in one sense, we are biasing people towards, you know, those types of um, uh, kind of artifacts. Um, but I think it's difficult because one of the problems we face with Europeana, particularly when it came to testing, is that because it's such a mess of stuff, if you like, there are some items, some collections that dominate. So, for example, we found that there's about a third or, yeah, it probably is about a third of the collection are coins from a large coin collection. For most users that we had in the, 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 the kind of testing, it's really dull. The results are the most uninspiring that you've ever had. And so what we had to do is sort of deal with some of that by kind of diversifying the results, by sort of mixing them up a little bit, by doing clustering and presenting people clusters rather than individual results. So in a sense, from that perspective, I guess we were also um, sort of messing up, biasing the results, but from the point of view of just engaging people, otherwise they're going to be completely turned off, which has a negative impact on our evaluation because then people rate the system as poor because of the boring content, as opposed to maybe some of the features that we've implemented. So there is a certain amount of bias we introduced. Um, I, now you've got me thinking about serendipity. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that expression. You know that expression, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Mm -hmm. Maybe serendipity is also what you get when you don't get what you want. And so is there actually a really interesting tension there between a search function that works well, i.e. it delivers, w delivers you what you want, and a search function that um, delivers serendipitous results which are not what you wanted or you didn't know you did? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so I think there is a tension there yeah. because I think again it's partly you know it depends it's all this question of it depends it's partly on the context so part of the context could be the task or could be the time that you have if you've got a bit of time to explore the collection and so on serendipity and those features to support it is probably good I mean it helps you discover identify new parts of the collection in another experiment we had um, this was on a different system but we had a, a recommender system for librarians who were trying to do cataloging it is completely the wrong type of functionality and of no use to them whatsoever. They have very known item style of searches. They don't want to be distracted. They've got a job to do. It's got to be done in so, so long. So again, I think that there is a tension in terms of partly it's understanding that context about what's the appropriate types of features, functionality to I I inject. Um, 